Good afternoon, everyone. Chris Green, the History Chap. Uh, Friday afternoon, our normal weekly uh, exploration, or is it a ramble, through British history and the events that have happened uh, this week in British history, or in British history this week. Not sure which way around it is, but I think you know what we're talking about, uh, going back into time and looking at some of the things that have happened, uh, that uh, some of the, the big stories and some of the slightly more bonkers stories as well. So uh, welcome to everyone. And I'm just looking in the chat. Gosh, we've got loads of people. Hello, Tony. Uh, see you're here from uh, Cheshire. Uh, Jen, as usual, lovely to see you. Uh, Mike, the disabled Welshman, uh, Tony Waterhouse. Thank you, folks. Um, where have we got? Uh, we've got uh, people from South Africa, USA. I saw uh, Leslie a little while ago popping up. Uh, oh, Charlie Manson, of course, from North Yorkshire. So we're already, uh, we're cracking in. I noticed we've got 17 people, I think, already on the call. So that's that's cool, isn't it? And, um, well, it's it's been another busy week in the life of the History Chap. I hope you've been having a good week, too. And uh, in particular, uh, this week's video, which has gone down a real storm, actually, uh, when the British fought the Gurkhas, which came out last night. And, uh, yeah, going really well. Had well over 10,000 views already, which is... It's not not, shabby, not too shabby, is it? And loads of great comments, loads of positive comments about my storytelling, which is lovely. Loads of positive comments about the Gurkhas and indeed a lot of them um, in the comments section, a lot of people saying, uh, you know, personal anecdotes about serving with Gurkhas or members of their family serving alongside the Gurkhas. And of course, that whole story is all, you know, in the mists of time when the British actually fought the Gurkhas back in 1814 to 1816, the Anglo-Nepalese War. And they came out of it with such mutual respect for each other that the British started to recruit Gurkhas into their army and started a 200-year tradition, which continues to this day. So uh, thank you to all of you who've watched it. And um, yeah, I don't know, let me just quick hello. We've got a Peter. Hello uh, from Bayern in Germany. Cool one. Uh, 1770, Captain Cook discovered Australia. Or at least he discovered it for the Brits, didn't he? I think Abel Tasman had a few uh, a few sailings around there. And, of course, uh, the Aboriginal people had discovered it sometime before that as well. But I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Mm. And we've got Indiana, USA. Bill, uh, you made it. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see all of you. So uh, let's kick off with the Diary of Events that happened in British history this week, which is where I'm literally going to race down, say a few words about each of them, and then we're going to dive into a few of the stories in a little bit more detail. OK, so um, belt up and here we go. Blimey, we've got, uh, we've got Tris from, from Sydney, Australia. So we've got Sydney, we've got Indiana, we've got South Africa. We're doing pretty well here, aren't we? Um, Germany, blinking hell. Stockholm, we've got two from Sweden. Blinking heck, right. OK, this is like, this is like the League of Nations. Oh, Norway. Not to be forgotten, of course. Uh, hopefully, I've got a little story for the Scandinavians amongst you in a little while. So let's kick off. Um, 14th, of, 14th of April, 1471, the Battle of Barnet during the uh, Wars of the Roses. Pretty much forgotten battle. And the real big bit of the Battle of Barnet was it saw the death of Warwick, the Kingmaker. Uh, I did a mini-series all about the Wars of the Roses a couple of years ago. And God, the 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 um the, the his his family were just incredible. The Nevilles were incredible for the power that they had and the maneuverings they had. And Warwick was the man who sort of made and broke kings. And um yeah, so interesting. Another character who was uh, was sort of used in the Game of Thrones or as a model in the Game of Thrones uh, series or, or books. So anyway, Battle of Barnet on the 14th of April, 1471. 14th of April, 1736, the Porteous Riots in Edinburgh or the Porteous Riots in Edinburgh began. Uh, and I'm going to tell you that story in a little while, a real forgotten piece of history. But... Um, yeah, bloody and uh, nasty. So um, get ready for that one, won't you? And, well, we couldn't get past the 14th of April without mentioning 1912. Just before midnight, look out Frederick Fleet on the RMS Titanic spots an iceberg straight in front of the ship on its maiden voyage. 
And strangely enough, that uh, road goes into the following day, 15th of April, 1912, in the early hours of the morning, uh, just after 2.30, um, the Titanic sinks with the loss of, well, nearly 1,500 people out of the 2,200 who were on board. And if I've got time, I'll tell you a little story about the Titanic later. It's a personal story. So, you know, maybe we'll have time for that. But, you know, you know, those of you who come on here regularly, you know that uh, I go all down lots of rabbit holes. So, uh, and lordy, lordy, we're only on the 15th of April at the moment. Uh, I'll come back and uh, let me just take a quick break and say good afternoon to a few more people. Uh, Tasha down in Kent. Lovely to see you. Um, oh, Leslie has said that this week in American history, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. I was going to say nice one, but I, I doubt Abraham Lincoln thought it was particularly nice. But you know what I mean. Uh, Sarah Jane, hello to you too. Uh, QA Library, thank you very much indeed. I hope your email is working. You sent lots of photos you have. Stay tuned. I've got something about Portsmouth later um, for you or potentially for you. So thank you for all the photos you've sent from Portsmouth with lots and lots of photos QA Library has sent to me regarding uh, Mark, otherwise known as, uh, regarding D-Day. And, of course, the crucial role that Portsmouth played in, in the D-Day operations in June 1944. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and Charlie said, you, we're all here for those rabbit hole moments. <laughs> oh, I've got a few for you now. So anyway, let's keep going, OK? 15th of April, 1942. Malta is awarded the George Cross. George Cross was... Um, uh, inaugurated in the Second World War by King George VI, uh, Queen Elizabeth II's father, current Charles III's grandfather, and it was for civilian acts of bravery. Of course, you have the Victoria Cross, which is purely for military people. So what did you do for civilians who did something uh, over and above? And of course, uh, the George Cross has been awarded many times since the Second World War for various people. But in 1942, 15th of April 1942, the island of Malta, was given the George Cross collectively. It's the only country ever to have received a, a medal for bravery as a, as a nation. And of course, this was during the Second World War where Malta held out in effectively a siege of Malta uh, during the Second World War, British Ireland, British, part of the British Empire at the time, and was besieged by the Italians and then the, the, the Germans, mainly aerial bombardments, but of course some, some naval operations as well. And the British were trying to keep it supplied with naval convoys, which were also attacked. But the people of Malta were being heavily bombed and they got the George Cross. George Cross is still on the flag of Malta. If you see a Maltese flag, the red and white, and there is a George Cross in it. So, you know, it's a uh, history continues to this day, doesn't it? And uh, sometimes we always wonder why these things happen. If you ever wonder why on earth Malta has a, a, a cross or a medal uh, on its uh, flag, that's it. Malta, GC. So um, 16th of April, 17. Oh, hang on. Sorry. Let's just have a quick look. Uh, -da -da There's some footage of that award to Malta, the King's visits. Oh, it could very well be, Bill. Uh, don't know. And, and if we're going to be anywhere, they'll be on YouTube, won't they? So have a look out for that one as well. Robin, thank you very much indeed for your generosity. That's very kind of you with a, a super like or a a, uh, a super at the bottom. Um, so thank you for those of you who throw a bit of money in the hat. It's like busking this, isn't it? But uh, um, historian busking. Mm, interesting. Right. 16th of April, 1705. Isaac Newton becomes the first scientist ever to be knighted. So there you go. This is a bit of a, a bit of a wacky. Uh, this is an awards week, isn't it? To to get the George Cross. Isaac Newton becomes the first scientist ever to be knighted. Sir Isaac Newton, as he's as he's known now. Not quite so cheery. Um, 40 years later, 16th of April, 1746, the Battle of Culloden in Scotland, near Inverness. Uh, the last pitched battle fought on English soil. And we I'm going to talk about that as our first story in a little moment, okay? Same date, 16th of April, 1797, the Spithead Mutiny, uh, a mutiny in the Royal Navy during the time of the French Revolutionary Wars. And I, I guess it's, oh, we're not going to go into it in any detail, but there's some great stories around this whole period. We tend to think of 
um, sort of Britain versus France. And you don't realize actually how paranoid the ruling classes in Britain were with potential mob rule and revolution. And, and Spithead was seen as part of that, uh, the Spithead mutiny put the, you know, and mutinies in navies do have a tendency to get out of hand, don't they? Uh, witness uh, the mutiny of the, the sailors in Kronstadt for the Russian Revolution and then the Russian Civil War beyond that. The mutiny of the Imperial German Imperial Navy at the end of the First World War really was, uh, uh, was the nail in the coffin for the Kaiser. And um, so, you know, naval, uh, na naval mutinies tend to give the ruling classes the EGBGs, and certainly they did with the Spithead mutiny. And I'm going to do a story about that at a later stage here on YouTube, OK, as a proper YouTube video. Uncle Heavy, what is a pitched battle? Well, put it this way, I've got a couple of things I will mention in Culloden. So keep that one in mind, OK, in a moment. Uh, but by all means, folks, join in the chat. Uncle Heavy said, what what classifies as a pitched battle? I seem to remember we had a little debate last week about what the hell, where's the line between a skirmish and a battle? And uh, I mean, there isn't, I don't think there is technically one, but um, by all means, join in, uh, join in, tell uh, Uncle Heavy what you think. What's your opinion? This is, if we're all sitting in a pub or around a campfire or something or at a barbecue, that's what we'd all be doing now, isn't it? Chucking, chucking our two penneth in. Uh, some very learned Others just gut feel or what we've heard or seen in films. That's all good, isn't it? So last one for the 16th. 16th of April, 1889. Charles Spencer Chaplin is born, otherwise known to the world as Charlie Chaplin or later Sir Charles Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin was born in South London in, on the 16th of April, 1889. Uh, an incredibly hard childhood. He, uh, poverty, I mean, there's lots of rags to riches stories of people born into poverty. We're talking poverty that inc included a boy before the age of 10 being in the workhouse on more than one occasion. Uh, a boy before the age of 10 being sent to uh, pauper's schools. And a boy by the age of 10, uh, his mother was in his mother was in a uh, was committed to a, what was called at the time a lunatic asylum, mental asylum with a mental breakdown, possibly also suffering from syphilis, I've read, um, and malnutrition. And their father, who had walked out on the family, was a uh, heavy alcoholic. When Charlie Chaplin became famous, of course, he continued to have reasonably left-wing political views, which, of course, were ultimately uh, led to his downfall in America during the McCarthy period. Uh, but, but with that sort of upbringing, you can understand why he might have had some of the political views he had. But there you go. Charlie Chaplin, born on the 16th of April this week in 1889. Uh, let me just check over at the comments because this is supposed to be a two way process. And, you know, I do love the sound of my own voice. So let's just have a look out. Um, Leslie's talking about one of the uh, Leslie's talking about one of the uh, aces, it, it, flying aces during the siege of Malta, Battle of Malta. QA library, uh, QA library, uh, was that why the Royal Marines were invented? Not quite sure what that's an answer to. So, apologies, sorry. I'm a uh, lot of chat, a lot of chat here about uh, Malta, which is really cool. It sounds like that's what might be one to do. Charlie Manson, Charlie Chaplin was from Traveller Gypsy Stock, you believe? Yeah, I can't remember quite where it is. It wasn't direct, well, it wasn't direct. One of his parents, one of his grandparents, sorry, was Romani. And I think it was in the Chaplin, on the Chaplin side, but I stand to be corrected on that. So yeah, he had he had some Romani, he had some, he definitely had Romani blood in him. Yeah. Um And we've got some just more discussion about what is a pitched battle or indeed, folks, what, what's the difference between a skirmish and a pitched battle? Anyway, let's crack on with what happened in British history this week, shall we? Uh, let me finish off the diary. Then we're going to go into the Battle of Culloden. How about that? So um, so keeping uh, we had Charlie Chaplin on the 16th, keeping it slightly arts. I don't do arts very often, do I? It's all battles and things. But uh, let's keep on the arts. The 17th of April, 1397. 
Geoffrey Chaucer gives the first ever recital of his, of his Canterbury Tales. So um, great book. I, I studied it actually at A-level in the old English, which was, well, yeah, it was revelation, put it that way. But a great story and, and um, some, again, I'm, it's a commentary on on England at the time in in that period of the Middle Ages, actually. Uh, just some of the characters, obviously, a completely fictitious thing, with some allegorical things in there. But he is is and some of the the this rum bunch of travellers or pilgrims setting out from London and going to Canterbury to the tomb of Thomas Becket or Saint Thomas Becket. Uh, so yeah, great. Uh, yeah, it's. Um, yeah, it was an enjoyable read. Maybe I should go back to it some stage. Um, but there you go. Uh, John, I started without you. I'm sorry, mate. You know, that it's just what happens when you're a Johnny come lately, literally. Uh, so, um, uh, but anyway, I've got something else about Archbishop of Canterbury or Canterbury uh, Martyrs in a moment for you. So, um, ah, da 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 dum, da 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 dum, da 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 dum. Du, 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 du. Uh, summertime blues. Should we have that? Uh, what else have we got? Come on, everybody. Uh, something else. I'm not talking about the Sex Pistols version, but on the 17th of April, 1960, Eddie Cochran, rock legend, rock singer, uh, is killed in a or dies following a car accident. Uh, dies in uh, Bath following the car accident in Chippenham. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that incident in a little while. But uh, uh, rock legend, American rock legend, uh, Eddie Cochran dies in Britain in a car crash. Um, so, yeah, so we'll come on to that in a little while. Speaking of Americans, 18th of April, eight, uh, 1968, 18th of April, 1968, uh, Robert P. McCulloch buys London Bridge. I mean, that sounds like one of those sort of scams, isn't it? April Fool's, like, you know, spot the sucker American tourist and sell him, like, St. Paul's Cathedral or Buckingham Palace. But genuinely, this actually happened. 1968, uh, Robert P. McCulloch buys a London bridge. And I'll see if I can come back to that one in a little while. But it's uh, he took it down stone for, stone for stone. He paid something in the region of um, $2.5 million at the time. And um, yeah, and uh, he took it over to America. So a genuine purchase of London Bridge, as I say, not not a not a scam selling someone Tower Bridge and some of the others that have taken place in the past. Okay, uh, and we'll tell. I will come back to that one in a while. Said I would talk about Archbishops of Canterbury, and on the nineteenth of April, ten twelve, we're back in Anglo-Saxon England, one of my favourite periods. Uh, ten twelve. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Aethelfled, uh, is killed by the Vikings. Uh, as the church would put it, he was martyred by the Vikings. Uh, Viking army, uh, this is in the period of Ethelred the Unready or Ethelred Unread. Um, this was around the time of um, Swain Forkbeard and, and his son, Canute. And... Um, the Viking army had landed landed at Greenwich, actually, on the River Thames, on the south bank of the River Thames, had marched inland to Canterbury, which even then was an important uh, Christian centre. And Canterbury had been established by, um, was already a cathedral, and um, uh, and uh, they uh, they stormed Canterbury. They actually, it was uh, someone betrayed the defenders, opened a gate, the Vikings got in, stormed Canterbury, stole lots of goodies, as was their way, and abducted the Archbishop of Canterbury. Took him to Greenwich and then demanded a further ransom from uh, from the king, Ethelred, Ethelred the Unred. Um, basically, you know, if you want your Archbishop of Canterbury back, we're talking significant noble here, okay? The archbishops and bishops at this time held enormous political and land power in, in England. But basically, if you want your archbishop back, you need to pay a ransom. He basically said, don't pay the ransom. He sent a message to the king saying, don't pay the ransom. So there's a bit of a standoff. Uh, by all accounts, uh, if you read between the lines, I think the Archbishop of Canterbury was a bit of a pain in the backside as a, as a you know, as a hostage. And Eventually, he was uh, he, he got to the point where either he wound the Vikings up or the Vikings were so wound up because they hadn't had a ransom yet that at a banquet in Greenwich, uh, they 
basically, um, they stoned him to death, but they didn't actually stone him to death. They used ox bones from their feast and were pelting him with these big ox bones. Uh, and we're not talking like chicken bones. We're talking like bones out of a cow here. And they were pelting him with this. In the end, the poor old archbishop was, was not, yeah, he was pretty, pretty, pretty much on his way out. And a Viking st went over with an axe and put him out of his misery. And, um, yeah, so so there you go. That's uh, an Archbishop of Canterbury. Obviously, the church uh, said that, you know, he had died for his faith. Um, and maybe he had. He certainly died because he was saying, don't negotiate with the hostage taker. <laughs> and uh, But equally, I've, I've heard other historians who said uh, that he was actually a pain in the backside. So he was the sort of hostage that you were you were hoping you could pelt with ox, stone, uh, ox bones at some stage. So there you go. Um, uh, boned to death. <laughs> Not saying any more, John. John, I, I'm pleased that thank goodness that you've arrived uh, arrived late. That's all I can say. So, um, last but not least, Americans. Thank you very much, John. Uh, but but we are uh, 17 19th of April, 1775, the battles of Lexington and Concord during the or at the start of the American War of Independence, or as some British would have called it at the time, the American Revolutionary Wars. So, um, but there you go. So, uh, a little nod over to you folks in the US. It's been a bit of a week in the US, isn't it? Because uh, was it Leslie said that uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated this week as well? So, it's a bit of a, an American week. Maybe I should do some more American history. But I do like British history. And can you imagine if I tried to actually divide my time between American history and British history? Holy moly. And last but not least for this week, 20th or th this week's diaries. OK, we'll get crack, crack on with a few stories in a minute. Uh, 20th of April, 1895, the siege of Chitral is lifted in British India. Chitral is in what's now Pakistan, right up on the northwest frontier border area with Afghanistan. And uh, uh, there was a garrison. It was a garrison of Indian, British Indian soldiers, mainly Sikhs, some Kashmiris. And they were under siege for nearly a month from locals. And I will tell you that story about the siege of Chitral in a little while today. OK, so there we go. That's a bit of a ramble. So, yeah, you know, Warwick the Kingmaker, Titanic, Malta with its George Cross, Sir Isaac Newton, Sir Charlie Chaplin, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer in his Pet Canterbury Tales, uh, Eddie Cochran, um, an American by the, uh, the 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 uh, London Bridge, Archbishop Canterbury th murdered by Vikings by having ox bones thrown at him during a banquet, uh, siege of Chitral uh, in the British Empire, the British Raj. How about that for a little week in, in British history? Um, oh, and the guy from uh, Seti Alpha v is saying, uh, April the 21st, 1918, Baron von Richthofen is shot down and killed. Thank you very much. I normally go from Sunday to Sunday to Saturday. So I, I might keep that one up my sleeve for next week as well for you. But thank you very much indeed. Um, do the French and Indian War, British and American history. That's definitely going to be on my cards, actually. We will go back and do some stuff. I really want to do a bit of an expose on Last of the Mohicans as well, the film film and book, and say, you know, how close was that to the truth? It's one of those little ones I like to do. By the way, a lot of you people have been asking about me doing a story about Peter Butterworth. Those of you who know, um, he was in the Carry On films. In fact, we just had the, the Siege of Chitral. He was in uh, the great Carry On film parody of the British Empire, the British Raj, Carry On Up the Khyber, one of my favourites. Uh, all shot in England, no, no India anywhere there. And do you remember he was the, uh, he played the French, sort of French merchant man in, who was under, at the, at the British, um, the, the, the British consulate, wherever it was, that was under, under siege at the time. Uh, Peter Butterworth, great man. Interestingly, um, he was actually a British prisoner of war during the Second World War. Uh, he was involved in the, um, oh, the Wooden Horse ex uh, uh, escape, where British prisoners basically dug a hole out of a prison camp by putting a, a, a vaulting box, gym box, on top. So they're all jumping over it while blokes underneath were digging away, made made into a film. And the, the great thing about Peter Butterworth was when they made the film, The Wooden Horse, uh, he applied <laughs> to be, a, you know, to have a role in the film. And he was actually told he was turned down because they reckoned he didn't look like a prisoner, didn't look very much like a prisoner, uh, to which he said, yeah, but I was actually there digging at the time. But there you go. So I think it might be a good story as well. 
Uh, right, let's crack on. So I mentioned actually that we had um, actually yeah let's let's get into the first story and then I'll come back. I want to just talk about the Gurkhas and that again. So. 16th of April, 1746, the Battle of Culloden, officially classified as the last major battle fought on British soil. Um, it pitted government forces against rebel Jacobites. Fought up near Inverness, right up in the, the, the highlands of Scotland, top end of Loch Ness, a beautiful area, very haunting, very quite an, an atmospheric battlefield. There are some around, and, and that's definitely, for me, uh, yeah, Glen, uh, Glen, Glen, Glencoe definitely is, but uh, uh, Culloden is as well. So this was at the end of the 1745 Jacobite Rising. Don't want to go into too much of the history, but I'm getting lots of requests to do the Jacobites as a series of videos or whatever here on YouTube. So I will get to them sometime this year, as in 2024. Um so uh, Jacobites had been, uh, they were the supporters of James II, who had been deposed by William and Mary. Uh, you know, so this was a, a Protestant Catholic split, and we've talked about that quite a few times here on our Friday shows. So um, the long and short, the, uh, the basically the English and indeed most of the Scottish didn't want a Catholic king. So they, when William and Mary and then Mary's sister, Queen Anne, died, they looked around and they found the House of Hanover over in Germany and they invited the uh, uh, George Duke of Hanover to come over and become king rather than one of the Jacobite Catholic Stuarts. And he came over, he was George I, and now we got down to George II, his son. Uh, meanwhile, of course, the said Stuarts, who had been deposed, James II, he'd now died, but his son was still alive and well, getting old. And so in 1745, his son, in other words, James II's grandson, Charles Edward Stuart, landed in Scotland and raised a rebellion uh, to try and reclaim both the Scottish throne and the English throne, and indeed the Irish throne, for his father, uh, who was called the Old Pretender. Jane, uh, sorry, Charles Edward Stuart, therefore, was called the Young Pretender. They had a series of victories. They gathered an army. Initially, the British government didn't think it was much of an issue. It became an issue when they defeated the government forces at Preston Pans outside Edinburgh. And they then marched into England. And, and then suddenly, like the British girl, the government down in London were like, oh, shit, we've got, we got a serious problem here, haven't we? And indeed, you know, they marched down the capture Carlisle Castle, moved down to Manchester, captured Manchester, moved on to Derby in the English Midlands. It was at Derby that... Um, he, Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, as he's known to history, was convinced by some of his generals to retreat back to Scotland. And effectively, they retreated with the government forces now chasing them all the way up through England, into Scotland, all the way up through Scotland. And eventually they were cornered and decided to fight at in just outside Inverness at Culloden. And we had a Jacobite army of about somewhere between five and 6,000, commanded by Bonnie Prince Charlie and a government army commanded by the Duke of Cumberland, um, and slightly bigger, about 7,000. It's one of those weird battles in, in history because the way it's told out is that it was brave Highlanders, and, and they were brave, but brave Highlanders versus nasty English redcoats. It doesn't help, that, but, and um, sorry, I'll come on to the commanders in a minute. Actually, it was a lot more mixed up than that. The brave Highlanders, also contained lowlanders from sort of the, the Edinburgh, Glasgow region of Scotland. They also contained Irish. There were French soldiers sent there, supplied by Scotland's old enemy, France, uh, sorry, old, old, old ally, France. And indeed, there were some English Jacobite supporters at Culloden fighting for Bonnie Prince Charlie. Meanwhile, on the government side, yes, there were plenty of English troops. There were also at least uh, four regiments of Scottish troops on the government side. They also had a regiment of Irish troops as well. And indeed, um, in the, the general occupation of Scotland, there were many German troops, uh, Hessians, who fought for the British at the time. So a little bit more mixed bag than maybe it's all, it's all painted out to be in easy history. Battle started, um, as I say, the, interesting, the two commanders, by the way. So we have Bonnie Prince Charlie. Bonnie Prince Charlie was 25 at the time of this battle. So again, we, we tend to see these battles, uh, sorry, these, these commanders as sort of aged veterans. 
Bonnie Prince Charlie, 25. He was actually up against the Duke of Cumberland. Duke of Cumberland was the third and youngest son of King George II. And um, he was 24 at the time. So we're talking to two lads in their mid-twenties commanding battles, uh, armies at Culloden. Battle started at 1pm with an artillery, or it's actually an artillery um, duel, but the, the Jacobites opened fire first, the, the government forces responded, and then shortly afterwards, Bonnie Prince Charlie ordered his army forward. Uh, it went forward in, in at varying paces. The the left flank got bogged, literally bogged down, trying to advance on the on the on the government lines, and consequently took a hammering. Uh, meanwhile, on the right, some of the Highlanders led a charge and actually reached the government lines. Again, films tend to suggest it was like this mass meeting of, of everyone. It's actually probably only about two Brit uh, two government regiments uh, bore the brunt of the Highland charge. Sustained gunfire. They had obviously more men in the first place. So the government forces, uh, they they hadn't left their positions. They were entrenched. Half the, the Highland army was uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie's army was bogged down literally, and uh, the firepower started to turn on the on the Jacobites. Uh, then then the Jacobites were cleared. The dragoons were sent forward by Cumberland, and um, they cleared. They well they they did butcher many of the Highlanders as they ran off the field or they chased them, which is what happened in those days. Um, the government casualties were something like 300. Jacobite casualties, that's killed and injured, wounded, uh, was somewhere in the region of 1,500 to 2,000 out of their army of five to 6,000 that was at Culloden. So uh, a, a devastating defeat for the Jacobites, bloody defeat in Scotland. Cumberland... Uh, then got the nickname of the Butcher because for the next few months he hunted down Jacobites and anyone who he thought were Jacobites. It was a it was a it was a pretty hard policy through the Scottish Highlands. Bonnie Prince Charlie, in the meantime, fled to the Western Isles, to the Hebrides, and spent the next five months actually um, being hunted through the Hebrides by government supporters, eventually boarding a ship to France in September. 1746, and he was never to return to Scotland. Cumberland would die in 1765, later on, just after his um, great nephew. George, sorry, that was a wrong pause there. Just after his great nephew, George III, had come to the throne. Uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie lived on till 1788, dying in exile. So there you go. How's that for how's that for folk? Um, let me just have a look over here. We've got um, all sorts of stuff. Let me just chill back up here. Um, we had some. I knew I knew if I meant if, I knew if I mentioned carry on up the Kyber, it would get comments. Uh, it was shot in Wales. Thank you very much indeed, QA Library. I knew it was shot somewhere in in Britain, and it would make sense to be Wales, things with sort of valleys and mountain things. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I need to do one about uh, King Arthur and the Wooden Rabbit. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uncle Heavy likes Carry On Up the Kyber. Right, I'm not going to go down the Carry On Up the Kyber bit, okay? Maybe I should do a, maybe I should do a film <laughs> video about that. Right, let's get back to proper British history. Uh, Danny, ah, you're in Australia, only tuning in now. Danny, welcome. You haven't missed too much. We've got a fair few stories to still to tell you. Um, and Jacobite history is really interesting says easy gamer um thank you very much i'll come back to a few of you guys in a moment and uh invisible ray the jacobites are traitors yeah well it's interesting because that is certainly one way you can look at them they tend to be portrayed in history or sorry they tend to be portrayed not least in cinema and novels as um freedom fighters but uh, that, like everything in life, you know, one person's freedom fighter is someone else's traitor or, or terrorist and vice versa. And Invisible Ray, I think you make a good point. We could, we could debate that one a little bit more um, in the future. Uh, and Charlie, Speed, uh, Charlie Manson has put the, the, the classic lines of the Skyboat song, uh, Speed Bonnie, uh, Bonnie Lad, Born to be King Over the Sea to Sky. Yeah, that's written all about Bonnie Prince Charlie. Uh, desperately um, being in the Hebrides and the Western Isles, trying to outwit the uh, well, the Duke of Cumberland and his supporters. So there you go. Um, right, where are we at? Just want to touch base very quickly on um, the Gurkha, Gurkha video from yesterday, uh, only to say I hope you've enjoyed it. If you haven't seen it yet, please have a look. 
when the British fought the Gurkhas back in 1814, 1816. What's really cool uh, as a segue is... Um, I'm a member of the, uh, the the Victorian Military Society. Surprise, hey! <laughs> great, great, great. Um, they produce co these quarterly, really good, really good magazines. Actually, uh, this this only arrived uh, yesterday. Really cool. Actually, really interesting when they when they uh, sent it. Two stamps on there. Oops, I'm bring it the other way. Woo! We've got King Charles the Third and Queen Elizabeth the Second. Stamps on the envelope. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna tear that off for um for my local Rotary Club who collects stamps for charity, but I might keep them actually. Anyway, a great, great magazine. And um, the interesting reason I was going to say about the Gurkhas is their AGM, which is in June. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, yes, June. Thank you, Pam. It no, no, it's not. It's thinking May. I'm, I'm going mad. I'm going mad. Uh, 18th of May is actually being held in the Gurkha Museum at Winchester. So I'll be going down to that. So if any of you are members and you're going, look out for me, say hello. And then if you're interested, um, Victor in obviously Victorian military and British military, this is in Victorian times, great little society to join. It doesn't cost a lot. If you're in the UK, I'm looking here, costs um, £30 to join for a year. OK, and as I say, you get uh, overseas folk, 40 quid or 43 if you're down in Australia, New Zealand. Um, and you get this magazine, which is really cool. Uh, a bit niche. So this, they spent quite a lot of time looking at uh, the loss of HMS Vanguard, which is um, a good one. They, um, they've they got a whole bit on uh, the Clash of Empires exhibition last year. They have a whole bit on the Diehards, who are this re- oh, I'm getting the wrong way. The Diehards, which is the reenactment group. Um, but they've, they've had a whole lot of stuff. Uh, John, John Grootboom, a forgotten hero in the takeover, Cecil Rhodes' takeover of what's now Zimbabwe. And as I say, they've got a couple of um, events coming up. They've got their, their AGM at the Gurkha Museum. And then actually, interestingly, in September, they've got Army, Empire and Cinema, which is being held at the National Army Museum. And they are they're going to be doing a whole lot of stuff. Uh, strange enough, uh, Ian Knight is going to be there talking about Zulu history in cinema, <laughs> of course. Uh, we've got um, Valley of Death putting the Crimean War on film. We've got Mr. Kipling's celluloid. Uh, um, we've got uh, Four Feathers. So we've got a fair bit there. So anyway, if you're interested, have a look. I'm not on any commission or anything. I just thought I'd shout it out for you. But um, And of course, uh, just speaking of Gurkhas, if you enjoyed it last night and you want to know more about General Gillespie and his incredible life, if you, those of you who watched the film, uh, watched the video last night, General Gillespie, the bloke who was killed in action during the Gurkha Wars, what a life fights a duel, kills someone in a duel, gets acquitted, mainly because most of the jury were army officers. <laughs> and he was a young army officer at the time, but he'd been on the run in Ireland. Uh, ends up in the Caribbean. He ends up uh, shipwrecked, yellow fever. Then he uh, he's told to go and accept the surrender or negotiate a surrender from the French garrison at Haiti, which is in the news at the minute, isn't it, with all its gangs. Was a French colony, was a part of the French Empire, and during the French uh, French Revolutionary Wars, he was he was um, he was swimming ashore with a white flag, and it was fired on while swimming with a white flag from the French. Later on, he ends up uh, single-handedly taking on eight intruders in his uh, property in his house in what's now the Dominican Republic, uh, Santa Dom uh, Santo Domingo, uh, in the Dominican Republic, and kills six of them with his sword. I mean, this is like a this is like a boy's own character, isn't it? Ends up in India, ends up leading the British occupation of Batavia, which is in Java, um, which was part of the Dutch Empire at the time, and then um, has a massive fallout with Stamford Raffles, the man who founded Singapore, and then ends up fighting in the Gurkha Wars, where he gets killed. Now, if you'd like to know a bit more about his story, then by all means join up. And uh, uh, that's going to be a, I'm going to do that specially for my members. So those of you who haven't watched it yet, who are members, that's coming up. You'll be getting a post in the community post just saying when it's coming. I can do it live, but I'll record it. So those of you who can't join me live can see it as uh, can see it as well. So and this is probably a good moment just to say uh, thank you to my members. Uh, Easy Gamer, I know you're here. QA Library, um, I think Leslie, Charlie Manson. Um, not sure who else is on is on here today, but um, uh, hello to all of you and thank you to all of you for being members of my history uh, history membership channel here on YouTube. Um, plenty more live talks coming your way. 
And what I'm going to do with some of those is we'll go a little bit more niche. So rather because a lot of you suggest great topics, but, you know, there is a bit about you have to play the YouTube algorithm a little bit. And some things are a little bit too niche. So, you know, Battle of Culloden, probably a really popular one. But maybe if we're talking about, I don't know, the Duke of Cumberland's military career, that's the sort of thing I'm going to start doing in my membership channel. OK, so there you go. Uh, and thank thank you. Thank you, folks. Um, and Uncle Heavy, during the Falklands War, the Argentinians were terrified that the Gurkhas would eat them. I have heard that a couple of times. They're also very terrified of being attacked with, by the, with the Gurkhas with their with their uh, cookery knives. Those those big machetes, effectively, uh, which are you know symbolic, and they are the, the symbol of the Gurkhas. Um, so yeah, they they certainly psychologically quite useful to have Gurkhas going up against your enemy. Um, but. Um, a uh, balaclava would be a good one. Funny enough, I've done balaclava in the past, both the balaclava and also the Charge of the Light Brigade. But they're two years, they're about two years old now. And you know, the history chap journey is it's turbocharged in the last two years. But um, there you go. Um, can I do a, a do a book of the dead? <laughs> People who died today. Do you know that's not a bad idea? That's actually a really good idea, Invisible Ray need a bit of work. Obviously, I can do it from some of the stuff I've already got. I, ha I do have a list of what happened in British history on different dates that I've compiled, not something, not a book that I've got, just literally a spreadsheet. So there you go. So let's move on. So uh, we just talked about the Battle of Culloden in 1746 in, uh, in Scotland. I want to stay in Scotland for the next story. 14th of April, 1736, 10 years beforehand. The Porteous Riots start in Edinburgh. Unless you are a real Scottish history fan, you probably haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. So let me enlighten you a little bit. Um, captain John Porteous was obviously a captain in the uh, City Guard of Edinburgh. OK, and he was about 40 years old. Well, he was 40 years old. Sorry, not that. he was 40 years old. And on the 14th of April, 1736, he was responsible for sort of keeping order at the execution of two well-known smugglers in the city. One of these ones where, you know, very often criminals become heroes, don't they? You know, look at the look at the, the great train robbers and people like that. Ned Kelly, you know, all these people become uh, uh, become heroes. And um, and we saw that very often down in, in London when at things like Tyburn and Newgate, excuse me, where people were being hung, the, the, the authorities once more were worried that the crowd might actually go with the criminals. Same situation happened in the 40, on the 14th of September, 1736 in Edinburgh. Uh, actually, three smugglers have been sentenced to death. One had actually been sent into exile instead. We know what exile meant at that time, off to the uh, principally off to the, the the New World colonies. Two were to be executed by hang, hanging on the 14th of, of April, 1736 in Edinburgh. Um, he was on, Porteous was there with the city guard to ensure that the hangings took place and also to prevent any disorder. Strange enough, when one of the men was being hanged, maybe he was dead, maybe he wasn't, a sailor tried to uh, cut him down. Porteous took out his, his pistol and fired a shot at the sailor to stop him doing that, managed to miss the sailor completely and managed to hit a member of the public who was standing there watching the, watching the execution. All merry hell now broke loose in the, in the, uh, from an angry angry uh, uh, public who were watching the execution. They'd been quite pro the smugglers, and now one of their own members had been shot by this government officer. Um, things started to get thrown. He then told his men to, uh, he then told his city guard who were with him to fire on, fire on the citizens. And five people were shot dead as they were being pelted with you know, whatever and were fearing for their lives. They managed to then withdraw up uh, the, the, um, the Royal Mile in Edinburgh uh, to, uh, to, a, to a stronghold, not in the castle, outside the castle on the Royal Mile. And the Lord Provost basically told them to issue gunpowder to all the city, uh, uh, gunpowder to all the city guards and to call the city guards out to restore order. This is all happening on the 14th of April, 17. Uh, 1736. 
Captain Porteous now uh, took out the city guard and fired over the heads of a crowd that were gathering. Angry crowd because the man had been shot. He fired over their heads. The only problem is, if you've ever been to that part of Edinburgh, you'll know there are a lot of tenement buildings around. And people were leaning out of the tenements to sort of see what was going on. You know, it's, you know, if they'd had mobile phones at the time, they probably would have been filming it, just like we have today. And unfortunately, by firing over the heads, he managed to miss the mob, but managed to hit people up in the tenements who were leaning out of their windows. Uh, injured, no one killed. Um, now the crowd really started to get incited. This was a, basically a, a, a psychopath in charge of the city city guard, or at least that's how they saw them. Okay, uh, they now started to get really things started to get really ugly. And at this stage, Captain Porteous told his men to level their uh, muskets and fire directly into the crowd, and another six people were killed. So we had by the end of the day, we had Captain Porteous had now had something like eleven people killed more injured pouring out of the tenement lots no doubt more injured actually in the crowd um those of you who follow any of my zulu war things you'll know that the british were not renowned for being crack shots at this time and sure as hell uh, the city of edinburgh guard weren't so there'd been plenty of injured fast forward captain porteous is put on trial for murder strangely enough uh, and in that's in july of 1736, a few months down the road, but I'll finish the story for you. Uh, he's found guilty and is sentenced to be hanged in Edinburgh. Uh, so poetic justice, I guess, for, you know, seeing that it all started with the hanging of those smugglers. And then uh, that was fixed for September. And then in September, Queen, or he gets a reprieve from Queen Charlotte, Sorry, Queen Caroline down in London and her prime minister, Robert Walpole, who felt that Porteous was being thrown under the bus to appease a riotous uh, assembly of people in Edinburgh. Uh, who, and, uh, and none of the rioters have been held to account, but somehow Porteous was. So they issued a, repri uh, a reprieve. News got to the people in Edinburgh that this murdering, blood-sucking captain had been reprieved. Well, you can imagine, think about the narrative we've had up until now. How do you think certain elements of the populace in Edinburgh felt about this? Well, a mob, maybe 4,000 strong, marched on the jail. He was being held in, um, he was being held in a jail, the, the jail at the toll bar. Toll bar jail in Edinburgh. They marched on the toll bar. They disarmed, well, you know, they disarmed the guards. In other words, the guards probably took one look at 4,000 people and thought, we didn't know which side our bread's buttered on. And they got into the jail, toll bar jail, and they seized Porteous. They brought him outside. They took him down to the exact spot where the smugglers had been hanged and they hanged him. They actually, it was a bit of a, it was lynching. It wasn't hanging, it was a lynching, uh, a bit of a farcical lynching. He actually got lynched three times uh, before he died. He actually was fighting people off. He didn't go meekly at all, but eventually he was hanged and, and, and died. No one was ever charged with his murder. He was buried at, um, at uh, he was buried in Edinburgh. Uh, no one was charged for his murder. Probably as a little footnote to this story, the Toll Bar Jail was eventually demolished, demolished in about 18, just after the Napoleonic Wars, about 1817, something like that. It was demolished and a mosaic was put on the uh, on the spot. It was called the, the mosaic was entitled uh, to, to remind, remind people of, of, the, of the prison. Uh, and the, the mosaic was uh, called the Heart of Midlothian. And that Heart of Midlothian title obviously inspired a football club in Edinburgh, Heart of Midlothian, whose badge is exactly the same as the badge, the mosaic on the floor at the Toll Bar Prison. And of course, uh, Heart of Midlothian is the title of a Sir Walter Scott novel, which draws on the events of the Porteous Riots as part of its narrative. So there you go, the Porteous Riots. I bet you didn't know too much about that unless you are a, a city guide, a city history guide in, in Edinburgh. So I don't know where we're all at here. Um, Bloodbath, I'm not quite sure, Invisible Ray, whether you're talking about Porteous being let loose in Edinburgh or uh, 
or, or, or the Gurkhas. Oh. 14th of April is the birthday of Richie Blackmore, guitarist of Deep Purple and Rainbow. Didn't know that. Um, I think we still got a bit of a debate going on there with Jen looking at this with uh, with folk about uh, the Gurkhas. Uh, James Jameson didn't know uh, didn't know this story. No. <laughs> and Jen Ingle, uh, hit the IKEA button, folks. I think you mean the like. Oh, you do. Yes, you do mean the like button. Please do. And, and don't forget, folks, when you're uh, watching any of my videos, do hit the like button. And if you want to make a comment, uh, however small it is, that's fine. YouTube like that. And let's be honest, it can't be as banal as some of the comments I get on YouTube. You should read them sometimes. There is people, I mean, they're smoking something, I think, uh, along along with the, the the wokes and the racists and everyone else. I get them all. Uh, I told you last week, by the way, that the Windrush, I got several nasty comments about the Windrush uh, and, and the people on the, or at least the, the immigrants on the Windrush. Um, nice to know that to balance off the books, I was accused of being a racist yesterday with one of my Indian mutiny um, stories. So there you go. Uh, it must be doing something right if you're ticking off people on both wings of the politics. <laughs> so there we go. Um, just a couple of things um, to to uh, to update you before I go on to my next story. A yank buying London Bridge, which is uh, I've got to just share with you that um, this weekend. <laughs> Uh, speaking of touristy sites, I'm off to London, a great city to visit. Funny enough, I bought Sarah a uh, we bought her for a birthday present. We're doing a guided tour inside Buckingham Palace. So that's quite cool. She'd never done that, um, and I've done it. Oh God, thirty odd years ago, uh, twenty five years ago. But um, but anyway, we're going to Buckingham Palace. But better than that, we're staying down in Windsor uh, because on Sunday, my son Jack is receiving his King Scout Award. First time since 1952, or I think this is 1951, actually, that King Scouts have been created. They've been Queen Scouts up until now, haven't they? So uh, really proud of him, bit of a proud dad moment. He, they're parading in Windsor Castle, receiving their uh, awards, and then they're having a service in, in St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle. So that's quite cool. Fortunately, I don't get into Win uh, St. George's Chapel. It's full of scouts and scout leaders. We get shipped off to some barracks, barrack room somewhere nearby where we uh, we can all watch it live on TV. So there you go. So, um, yeah, looking forward to that. Uh, what a nice way to do Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle. Blimey. It's like a, a royal fest, isn't it? So let me tell you about um, a, another landmark. We've done Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle. How about London Bridge? There's been a London Bridge or bridge uh, over the Thames at on the site of London Bridge now since Roman times. In the Middle Ages, it was uh, finally made into a stone bridge. And of course, you've probably seen some of the photos or photos, or sorry, paintings of, of London Bridge from this period, because it wasn't just a bridge. It was a bridge with a sort of mini city. Buildings were put on it. There were 108, sorry, 138 buildings on London Bridge. So you had a road, a bridge, a road, and then you had basically, it was a thoroughfare. And we had houses, we had shops, we had taverns, the whole length of the bridge. Um, became a couple of things. It, first off, it, it became it became a fire hazard because, and there is a famous occasion, The very, uh, you've all heard of the Great Fire of London in the 1660s, where St. Paul's Cathedral gets burnt down and Christopher Wren rebuilds it, current St. Paul's. There was actually a Great Fire of London in the Middle Ages. And the Great Fire of London in the Middle Ages was basically on London Bridge. And, and it was it was jumping along from, from building to building on London Bridge. Caused a huge amount of uh, uh, many, far more casualties than the the Great Fire of London in the, in the 1660s. People jumping off into the river, trying to escape the flames and, and drowning. Anyway, so we have London Bridge, fire hazard. It became a it became a traffic it became a, a, a well a gridlock because can you imagine you've got this this bridge but actually something like two thirds of the bridge in its width were actually uh, with buildings so you had this narrow thoroughfare running across the Thames and at the time of course it was the only bridge across the Thames and it remained so until Victorian times okay so so London Bridge an important route coming up from Kent and and the and the Channel ports coming into London and crossing London. Um, so, and of course, 
the weight of all those buildings actually was starting to, to weigh it down. It was starting to collapse under its own weight, which hence is the, the, the children's nursery rhyme and song, you know, London Bridge is falling down. That's where it all comes from, the medieval bridge. Eventually, it was no longer fit for purpose and it was demolished in the early uh, in the early 19th century. And there was a competition to build a new bridge. Thomas Telford entered it. He had this great, he was going to do a single span bridge. Have you ever seen any pictures of it? Really, it looks really, really cool. Uh, they, uh, it needed a huge run in, basically, either side, of the, either side of the Thames. And it was decided that that was a bit too much like hard work, at not least trying to convince land, landowners to give up some of their land. So a, uh, a more, a more uh, a, an archway bridge was, for, uh, was built. John Rennie was the architect, and it was opened by King William IV, Queen Victoria's uncle, in uh, 1834. And that survived, well, through Victorian times, the height of the, you know, that that's the London Bridge that people see from all the black and white pictures when we talk about British Empire and stuff, and survived First World War and Second World War. By the end of the Second World War, Traffic volumes were now increasing. Motorised traffic was increasing. And basically, once more, the bridge was not able to cope and it was going to collapse. Uh, so um, a new uh, they, uh, they needed to build a new bridge. And what better way to build a new bridge than to flog off the old one? And consequently, in 1968, this week in 1968, uh, the 18th of April, which is what, yesterday, 18th of April, 1968, uh, American. Robert P. McCulloch buys London Bridge, bought it for $2.4 million, which is about $17 million today. And he took it down brick by or stone by stone and rebuilt it in America. Rebuilt it actually at um, Lake, uh, Lake Havasu City in Arizona. And it's still there to this day. You can cross the old London Bridge. Uh, and we got the new London Bridge opened uh, by Queen Elizabeth II in the very early 1970s, which is the one we still got today. So there you go. A little. There's some great stories around London Bridge, not least that first fire in the medieval times, but also, of course, London Bridge in the medieval times, it had so many arches that actually it slowed up the water flow. And the water upriver, upstream from London Bridge, was almost like a mill pond. And it used to rush through these arches. So it's yeah, a bit like a mill stream rushing through the arches. Uh, the, the Thames boatmen became skilled at uh, taking their boats through there and actually doing ad adrenaline rides for people back in the, the 16th, 17th century. If you know, if you wanted a bit of a thrill, you, you went through the arches and, and, you, and you took your life in your hands doing it. But interestingly, the mill pond factory created a slow water mill pond sort of feel. And that's partly why uh, the Thames used to ice over. And of course, famously, the Thames actually had some huge winter fairs on the Thames when it was frozen over. Massive fairs on the River Thames. I think those would be quite good stories to tell at some stage. Not quite like the Gurkhas fight, the British fighting the Gurkhas, I appreciate, but quite fascinating little stories from British history. Because, you know, British history isn't all about battles. True. Honest. Nor is it all about kings and queens. And sure as hell, it's not all about the blinking Tudors either. So anyway... There we go. That's um, that, that's uh, that's that's McCulloch. So let me tell you about another event. Speaking of battles, let me give you one more event for today. Uh, the 20th of April. Actually, I was going to do Chitral. No, I'm not. I'm not because we are nearly at an hour. So skaters on the Thames. Absolutely. London Bridge was a weir. Yes, it was a weir QA library. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, and the, the water was was pouring through. Uh, the mini ice age. Uh, yep. Uh, so, uh, yes, the Thames Frost Fairs, I think that's a vote. Someone said General Monk. You, is that you want a, a, a story about General Monk? OK, um, just just a um, proper job. Just bear with us on this, because some of this, you know, I was saying earlier about I might do some things like General Monk and that might become uh, more things that my members get. And that's that's not a push. I've, I've just got to do it. I can tell a lot of stories like this. OK, talking to camera and um we can cover a lot of ground. I can cover a lot of stories from British history like this. The wider YouTube viewers like to see pretty pictures and well scripted stuff. Not me saying, uh, um, oh, let me just go down this, this rabbit hole for you. OK. 
And that takes a lot of time. So if I'm going to start doing things like General Monk, I might be doing them more like this. And my thought is more like it. members will probably appreciate it. Uh, whereas Joe Public, if they came on and I was talking about General Monk, who, by the way, very interesting character, well worth doing a story about him, critical role in British history, British political and royal history. So, um, uh, and an interesting bloke as well. So I might do some more stuff in the membership area. That's just a word of warning to you, but you guys are on here. You'll be getting the heads up when I do, okay? So let's go to the 17th of April, 1960, because so far we've done a bit of, uh, we, you know, we've done Culloden, we've done Porteous Riots, we've done McCulloch buying London Bridge and a fair bit of the history of London Bridge. Let's come into something slightly more pop culture. 1960, 17th of April, 1960, Eddie Cochran, dies in England. He doesn't just die. He dies because he's been in a car crash in England. He had uh, Eddie Cochran. Uh, I'm sure I, I'm getting the feeling with my my viewer base that many of you will know Eddie Cochran and his songs. But for anyone who's thinking, mm, I've heard the name, but not sure, uh, we'll go Summertime Blues. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. And you're going to be you're going to be humming that. I bet you can be humming that around for the rest of the blinking day. Just planted it in there for you. Um, but uh, come on, everybody. Another one you might be singing, or indeed something else, uh, was another one of his ones, something else, also covered by famously by the Sex Pistols. I actually quite have to be honest, not a fan of punk rock, but the Sex Pistols version of, of, uh, of something else is actually quite good. But there you go. So he'd been on a tour in, from obviously American rock and roll star. He'd been on a tour in Britain since January of 1960. Um, and on the 16th of April. 1960, he had played at the Bristol Hippodrome. He was now heading off to the next, uh, towards London. They were in a taxi, uh, traveling um, tra traveling off out of, out of Bristol. Uh, inside the taxi was his songwriter, come girlfriend, um, oh, Sharon Sheely, his tour manager, and Gene Vincent, rock and roll star as well. The, obviously, and the 19-year-old taxi driver. They'd left Bristol. They'd now coming in towards Chippenham, uh, coming up uh, Rowden Hill in Chippenham when the car hit a lamppost, full on hit a lamppost. And uh, Eddie Cochran was thrown from the car, suffered traumatic brain injuries. He was taken to a Bath hospital. He was taken initially to the hospital in Chippenham. They realised that we need to get him somewhere bigger and, and uh, more experienced with this sort of thing. He went to Bath and he died at in hospital in Bath on the 17th of April, 1960, age 21. Uh, it was a dry night, uh, dry weather. And basically, it was found that the taxi driver had been driving at excess speed. We don't know if that was because Eddie Cochran told him to or whether the taxi driver was just showing off because he was 19 and he had like uh, Eddie Cochran and, and Gene Vincent in the car. We don't know. But um, he was banned from driving for 15 years. He was um, he's disqualified from driving. But um, th there you go. Eddie Cochran, 21. Um, a bit like a Dean Martin sort of character. You know, just young, young forever, really, aren't they, with that? Now, I was going to finish here, but... I do have um, I do have one last story about the Titanic. I don't know if anyone wants to see it or hear it, or do I do I just record it and send you send it out with a few nice little visuals? It's a great story about two people who survived the Titanic. Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll do a I'll do a small one, a small video for you. Oh oh no oh no God no <laughs> everyone's off. <laughs> um, Either way, I'm in. OK, more, more. <laughs> Anyone would think it's Friday afternoon. I bet the Australians are thinking, oh, God, no more. Surely to God. Do And Charlie Manson saying do a short. Um, did someone say De James Dean, not Dean Martin? Oh, did I say Dean Martin? Oh, I'm a prat, aren't I? There you go. Uh, YouTube love shorts. Uh, they do indeed. So maybe I'll do it as a short. Uh, oh, let's hear now. Well, I'll tell you what. Ooh, ooh, what do I do? What do I do? Eh? Um, I am. 
<laughs> Before that, I've just seen a fantastic quote. You're not drunk if you can lie on the floor without holding on from Dean Martin. Uh, I think it, I've seen another one from Dean Martin as well. She, he felt sorry for teetotal people because when they wake up in the morning, that's the best they're going to feel, <laughs> which I think is a great one as well. Um, do one now and create a short as well, Charlie Manson. You should be a politician. Yeah, have your cake and eat it. Go on then. I'll tell you a quick one now. We all know about the Titanic and that 1,500 people died on the Titanic out of the 2,200 crew and passengers on there. And by the way, uh, there were something like over 40 nations represented on the Titanic. Only one nation managed to get all their people off the ship. 100% survival rate. Any idea which nation that might be? Obviously, it wasn't the British or the Irish, was it? But um, Australia. There you go. Australia. Not the Chinese. No, Ch Chinese had people on the Titanic and quite a few of them are drowned. Syrians as well. Uh, it's uh, but no, we've got uh, it's it's Australia. But I'll let you into the statistical secret. OK, there was one first class passenger from Australia. They got they got into a lifeboat, but they are the only nation when you put all the nations, how many were on there and how many died. They're the, they're the only ones who have a big fat zero there. Anyway, that's not the story. On the ship, on the Titanic, on that last fatal night, there was a steward in the first class lounge. His name was Bill Barrows, and he thought he was the luckiest man alive. Not because he was working on the Titanic on its maiden voyage, or indeed an employee of the, of the White Star Line, but although he had only signed on recently for the Titanic, he'd, he'd, um, he'd sailed on other ships before, but he was on the Titanic, but because Back in England, in North London, Middlesex, he had a fiancé. He was going to get married on his return. So he'd get to New York, turn around, come back, and he would return. He sent, a, sent, an, e uh, sent an email, hello, sent a telegram to his fiancé saying, sailing gaily, we'll see you on my return. Lots of love, Bill. In fact, his, uh, his bride-to-be, Ada, Ada Axford, was so excited she'd already bought her wedding dress for the big day. On the ship in second class was another man who felt equally lucky. His name was Mr. Dean. Dean was traveling to America with his wife and his two small children, including his very small baby daughter, Milvina, and her brother, Bertram. Mr. Dean was really lucky and felt he was the luckiest man in the world. They were going to go to, um, oh, Lordy, where were they? I can't remember where they were going, actually, now. But they were, they were heading over. They were going to join his brother, uh, opening a tobacconist shop. He was really lucky because they'd been booked on another ship. And when the Titanic set sail, Britain was in a national coal strike. Coal supplies were actually in short, in short demand. And the Titanic was obviously the big, it was the big kudos ship in Southampton Harbour. It was going on its, it's going on its maiden voyage across the Atlantic. So basically, the White Star Line leaned on all their their friends and the other the other the other shipping companies and said, Look, "Give us a bit of coal, will you? Give us some coal." And the other, they did, so that the White Star Lines. RMS, RMS Titanic could go across the Atlantic. That meant some of the other ships didn't have enough coal to go across the, across the Atlantic on their voyages, including the ship that was going to carry the Deans to their new life in the USA. But good news. RMS Titanic, or the White Star Line, should I say, got in touch with the Deans and said, look, you know, we appreciate that, you know, you've been a bit put out here, haven't you? We'll give you, as a goodwill gesture, we'll give you a complimentary ticket to come on the, the Titanic. <laughs> and some of you think that you have a bad life sometimes. The Deans, therefore, were on the Titanic, on its maiden voyage, on this great ship, the biggest ship afloat at the time. And uh, they were on their way to the new world and the new life there. And then, of course, just before 12 o'clock midnight uh, on the 14th of April 1912, Frederick Fleet up in the, the, the crow's nest spots the iceberg and the rest as they say is history 
Mr. Dean put his wife and his two small children into a lifeboat. They were lucky enough to find a lifeboat, even though they were second class uh, in se traveling second class, and said that he would be joining them soon. And the lifeboat was lowered away. And that was the last that Mrs. Dean, Bertram and Milvina saw of their dad. His body was never recovered. Another body that wasn't recovered was uh, that of uh, Bill Barrows, first class steward of the Titanic, engaged to Ada. Ada never married. She kept her dress in a locker um, in the attic in their house, you know, her house in uh, Edmonton, North London, Middlesex. She dressed in black for the rest of her life. She died in the 1960s. She dressed in black. She never had a nice word to say about anyone or anything. In fact, someone who knew her actually described her as a miserable old cow, which is a, which is a nice quote, isn't it? Milvina Dean did survive. In fact, to her and her mother and brother came back to Southampton. New life in the new world was off. She lived the rest of her life in Southampton. She, you can see videos of her actually here on YouTube. An amazing woman. She only died. She was the last survivor of the Titanic. And she only died mm, uh, 15 years ago, something like that, maybe a little bit longer. She was, she was knocking on the door of 100. And um, she was cheerful. She had this um, upbeat view of life, which that she'd survived and she was going to live every day like it was her last. Which is interesting because we had Ada Axford, who lived every day as a permanent funeral like Queen Victoria. I've told this story in the past because it's interesting, isn't it? How people view events differently. The event was exactly the same. The RMS Titanic uh, went down. Melvina Dean lost her dad. Ada lost her fiancé. But life is all about how we we look at it, how we interpret it. It's the same with history, you know, with people who make comments on my videos. It's, I've said before, you know, one person's hero is someone else. One person's freedom fighter is someone else's terrorist and vice versa. But there is a classic example of how you can have one event, but two totally different outcomes. One woman living like it was always a funeral and the other woman living life to the end. Milvina Dean, as I say, when she died, actually, uh, she's had a park named after her in Southampton. It's still the Memorial Park, the Milvina Dean Memorial Park. The reason I tell that story is not just because I think it's an interesting difference in the way that people look at the events that happen to, to them and the way we all look at different events in our lives. But you probably wonder who the person who described Ada Axford as a miserable old cow was. Well, that was actually my nan, Millie Harris. Um, and we know, her, you know, um, you've seen her husband's medals here on my, on my bookcase. Millie Harris was the niece of Ada Axford. So she is my great, great aunt. And right to the 1960s, she lived with the trauma of never marrying the man she loved. There you go. I bet you haven't heard that story about the Titanic before, hey? Eh? So, um, so there you go. Uh, that's the Titanic, um, and we're not going. I'm not going to bother with the siege of Trial today, but um, I think um, I think that's in, that's a, that's enough on that cheerful note. God dear, um, I will I will let you get on your merry ways. Suffice to say that I've been asked by an organisation called Restless to uh, do a talk, online talk, about the Romans in Britain. And that's going to start in June, actually, a four-part series. Uh, Restless are really good, great organisation, actually. Loads of adult learning, OK, online. Not just history, uh, the arts, travel, well-being. There's all sorts of stuff on there. I think um, premium members, they have about 100 videos they've got access to. So a great little learning platform. If you're interested in... Um, seeing those talks and getting access to those talks, I've pinned right at the top of the comments, you can see my website, 
thehistorychap.com. If you go to my website, drop me a line in the contact thing and I'll get you a link because uh, funny enough, I've actually uh, negotiated with, with Restless that uh, um, some of my fans, both here and in my newsletter, can get a two months free membership. So if you're interested in trying it out and certainly seeing me in action, or at least part of me in action, then just drop me a line and I'll send you the link. Um, no, 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 no skin off my nose, okay? Next week, we've got uh, Admiral Thomas Cochrane on his way, the original master and commander. I'm coming very soon. I've also got the Invergordon Mutiny, the last mutiny in the British Navy, or in the Royal Navy. So there you go. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, let me just quickly double double check what we've got. Uh, oh, someone said poxy adverts. Great expectations. Oh, <laughs> John, you live a life of danger, don't you? Uh, JP Morgan got richer. Yep. Um, <laughs> you've got all afternoon. Well, I would have all afternoon. And, you know, I, I do enjoy chatting history. Uh, funny enough, oh, speaking of chatting history, um, Career Library, Mark, you've, I've been invited tentatively to come down and speak in Portsmouth on the 8th of June at a D-Day event. Uh, obviously got a little bit of costs and things to um to to thrash out at the moment but um so i might be down your way so thank you very much for all the for all the info and it'd be lovely to meet up with you in person uh and for those of you as i said who, who like want to meet up don't forget we've got the uh, uh victorian military societies agm in may at uh, the gurkha barracks in winchester or gurkha museum sorry in winchester i've also i'm intending to go to the battle of tewkesbury reenactment uh this year and also to the Battle of Evesham reenactment in August. Not speaking or anything, I'm just going to be there. So if you're around, it'd be great to, you know, drop me a line and say, I'm going to be there as well, Chris. Uh, we, can, we can try and meet up. That'd be lovely. But in the meantime, folks, have a lovely weekend. And if nothing else, I bet you're, what, you're humming away Eddie Cochran tunes for the next couple of hours. Till next time, take care. Thanks for joining me and keep very well. Thanks. <laughs>